Hey, how's it going? I'm George with Eden Church. We're continuing in the Believer's Authority, and we're at this place, I'm going to call this Faith Pleases God. This is one of the first steps, one of the first things into understanding your authority in Christ is understanding faith. Now, I'm not using faith like a term like people do this all the time, and it's I, I feel incorrect when people talk about, well, what faith are you from? Or, or what, what faith are, you know, well, I just, you know, I, I don't practice faith. And they're talking about that, a particular denomination or religious affiliation or thing. That, that's not what faith is, okay? I'm talking about faith pleases God. And that is basically a trust a confidence in what he says is true. And so we're going to go through and we're going to look at how faith pleases God. We're going to take a few examples of faith that was shown. And we're going to start, and I think pretty much we're going to just stay in. Uh, and we'll, we'll be in some other you know scriptures around it. But we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. To read this because I want us to get a fuller understanding and there's some things that, that they say in here that I'm going to use. Normally I use the modern English version of the Bible, uh, but I'm going to be using uh, for this reading uh, the amplified version. And so we're going to read through it and then we're going to get into it, all right? So we start in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Okay, and this is what it says. Now, faith is the assurance, confirmation, title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. For by faith, trust, and holy fervor born of faith, the men of old had divine testimony born to, uh, born to them and obtained a good report. By faith we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purposes by the word of God, so that we, uh, what we see was not made out of things which are visible. Prompted, actuated by faith, Abel brought God a better and more acceptable sacrifice than Cain because of which it was testified of him that he was righteous, that he was upright and right standing with God. And God bore witness by accepting and acknowledging his gifts. And though he died, yet through the incident, he is still speaking. Because of faith, Enoch was caught up and transferred to heaven so that he did not have a glimpse of death. And he was not found because God had translated him. For even before he was taken to heaven, he received testimony still on record that he had pleased and been satisfactory to God. But without faith, it is impossible to please and to be satisfactory to him. For whoever would come near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him out. Woo! That's awesome. We're going to get into the awesomeness of it. But we got to understand that faith pleases God. Okay? And, and so what I want to start in is we got to start with this understanding that, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. As a matter of fact, we're going to go back and look at that 
first verse, and we're going to really dissect it. It's It's the assurance, it's the confirmation, it's the title deed. Faith means you have something. Okay, and so when we're talking about in the believer's authority, that could be speaking about something you prayed or asked God for or that you've spoken to that you believe that you have the right to it. Okay, and so that title deed really uh, solidifies that answer. See, in the house that I'm in, if somebody came and said, no, this is my house. I have this piece of paper that's the title deed. And if the title deed has my name on it, then it's my house. If it has their name on it, then it's their house. And so if the police were to show up and I have the title deed, because these people are saying, get them out of my house, this is my house. And then I show the police officer with my uh, 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 my driver's license, or, you know, so I show them, look, this is me. This is my name on this piece of paper, and this is the title deed to the house. Well, what will end up happening is that the police will then talk to that other person, tell them, you got to go. It's like, no, I don't care. You need to take it up, but you got to leave because he has all the right to be here. It's this is his. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the title deed of what you are believing for. It says uh, it's the conviction of their reality. See, there's a lot of times when you say I have faith, kids really operate in faith like it's going out of style. You know, they believe some things and you're just like, why do you believe that? And then as an adult with your cynical ideas and behaviors about that, you, you know, kids will speak something and you're like, "Yeah, yeah, that's not how that worked, kid. But the thing is, is that we actually need to be a lot more like those children. It tells us in Romans 17, I mean, Romans chapter 4, verse 17, it says this, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations before God, whom he believed and who raises the dead and calls those things that are, do not exist as though they did. That's faith calling things that do not exist as though they did. That's what it's getting at into uh, Hebrews 11.1. 1. It's that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence. It's your surety that those things actually exist. Okay? Why is this important to understand this? It tells us in chapters, I mean, in verse 6 in Hebrews, that, that it's faith that pleases God. Without it, you cannot please God. <laughs> See, many people try to think it's by their actions, it's by, well, I live a super holy life because I do this, because I do that, because I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I judge, and I manipulate people into making sure they get to church and making sure they do the things that I think are good and holy. God's like, that's not the stuff that pleases me. What pleases me is when you believe what I said and that thing that I told you would happen, when you believe that, that's what pleases me. And so there are many different examples in here. Verse 3, we get an example uh, in in here where it says this, uh, Hebrews 11.3, By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You see, when we get an understanding that we look in John chapter one, it tells us the word was uh, in the beginning. The word was with God. The word was God. Okay, The, the world was framed by the word of God. See, what you have to understand is this. God is a spirit. He is a spirit that speaks. Oh, now this is interesting. This is a key reason why faith pleases God. Faith pleases God because when we understand that God is a spirit that speaks and what he says, he has full belief it will do. When he says a word, it's done. Let there be light. 
and there was light. You see what I'm saying? So he's a spirit that speaks. The reason why it really pleases God, faith pleases God, is because when we start speaking like God speaks, believing his word, holding on to the word of God, when we start holding on to those things, we're then showing ourselves to be his children. (laughs) I know people have never thought of it like that. But when you understand that you are a spirit, now you who you are, you are inside this body, but you are a spirit. Who else is a spirit? God's a spirit. Tell us in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, he said he, he spirited into man the spirit of life. He breathed into man the spirit of life. So the, he, he, God is a spirit, right? He took of himself and put it in this body. You are a spirit because Jesus said those who are born from above, born again, well, they can enter the kingdom of heaven. So you're a spirit. And when you start speaking what God speaks, you become a spirit that speaks. You necessarily believe that what you spoke is true and going to come to pass. You have full assurance that what was spoken and what you say will come to pass. That's just like your daddy, Father God. Your father spoke and necessarily believe what he said comes to pass. When you start speaking, you then look like your daddy. And every dad, every parent, every mom, we're proud when our child does something on their own for the first time. Think about it. When uh, a baby's born, uh, whether it's uh, somebody has to feed that baby. And then a baby gets to be about two months old and they start getting this, they get a touch of coordination down, but then that maybe can just hold their bottle for themselves. They at least can prop it in the position. But then they get, and they get to that point where they start eating like baby food, you know, or they get like a Cheerio and they, they, they still trying to figure it out, but then they get it to, but then it comes to that day that they're sitting at the table and they have, uh, cause you give them a butter knife cause you still don't trust them with a steak knife. Uh, you give them a little butter knife and then they're cutting their own food and they're eating. That point is there's that process where it's like you're watching the growth and maturity of that child and it gives a parent pride, right? Okay. And so what happens is, is God is pleased by faith because when he sees his children start to operate in faith, he's like, They're being just like me. That's a moment of pride for God. That's something God is like, that pleases him. So uh, when we go to this, and I I want us to go to uh, 2 Peter. And I talk about this verse a lot. I know y'all probably heard this every single video in this series thus far. Guess what? You're going to hear it again. Okay. But 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verses uh, 3 and 4. Okay. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence, by which he has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, so that through these things you might become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. It's power packed. Like this is probably one of my life verses. God has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. He's given it all to you. And so when you think about him giving this all to you, I'm going to come back once again, go back to spirit, soul, body. Watch that again. You are a spirit. You've been born from above. Your spirit has been joined in one spirit with the Lord. Like you are a spirit. And in that, he's given you everything. All right. 
pertaining to life and godliness, you have a soul, mind, will, and emotion, okay? You live in a body. Now, when it's saying here that God has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, he's saying you everything you need to live. That's why you can be born again, born from above, have a brand new spirit. Now, one of the promises is the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's one of those other things that helps you become and helps you live to the fullness. But once again, in this brand new spirit, you have everything pertaining to life and godliness. This is one of those times you have to have faith. You have to trust what God is saying to you is true. But he says that those things that you have, they come to you as you, through the knowledge of Christ. Hmm. So the more you get into God's word, the more you seek revelation and knowledge from God, the more what's already in you comes into the natural world. See, the more you believe that what God said is true, just like God is a spirit and spoke, you as a spirit speak his word also, and those things will come to fruition. They'll come out. The word is manifest. They will manifest themselves in your physical world. Because just like God created the earth out of things that were not seen, he spoke into the nothingness of this world, things that were seen in the other world. He spoke those things from that world into this and made everything we see. He spoke from the invisible and made it visible. Okay? And that's what we're supposed to do. That's part of the believer's authority. That's one of the main thing of the believer's authority is we speak like God speaks. We speak like God speak by believing his word, but that means we have to have understanding and knowledge of God's word. See, that's why I tell people a lot of time, man, make sure you're reading scripture. Make sure you get into God's word because he has... Uh, the, the thing is, is like in movies, they call them Easter eggs. Ooh, did you see that Easter egg? Did you see that Easter egg? There are little things that are in the movie that they technically don't have anything to do with the movie, but they have everything to do with the overall story of a movie. There are little Easter eggs in here for you. There are things that you can understand about God and about what and about who you are in him. You have all things, all things. You have all things. You have all healing. It's already in you. But it takes the knowledge of God to draw it out. You, you have all things. You have, you have financial resources at your disposal. But it takes God and the knowledge of him to draw it out. You have like all the blessing of God, but it takes not, but that it comes through, like it says here in verse three, it comes through the knowledge of him. The more you know Jesus, the more those things are released from you, from your spirit into the spiritual realm. The more information that your mind receives about who Jesus is, your then mind agrees with what your spirit already knows and your spirit releases that into the natural world. This is awesome. This is the kind of teaching that I wish I would have had when I was in college instead of, you know, some of the things that I kind of went through. I, I wanted to kind of know the brass tacks of how to get this stuff done. But the thing is, is his divine power has already given you everything. You just need to know him so he can draw it out. That's good. That's a good word. That by these precious promises, you would be a partaker of his divine nature. Believe God's word. Have faith that it is necessarily so. 
Um, some of the things that we're going to look at here now is we're going to look at uh, some of the faith that was just mentioned in those first six verses of uh, Hebrews. We're just going to look at a few of those guys because, we, you know, these are guys who they retained, they attained a good report. Like, because they believed God, okay? So we're just going to go back and read some of their story just to, just to see what it looks like to have faith. What does that mean? In Genesis chapter 4, verses 3, uh, I think we're going to go 3 uh, through 7. It, it's gonna, it says this, In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had respect for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he did not have respect. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It's desire to dominate you, but you must rule over it. Now, I know this talks a lot about Cain, but I want to focus in on what it said about Abel. God had respect for Abel and his offering. See, the thing that we have to look at, it came about in the course of time that the Lord was commanding an offering. How did Abel know what kind of offering to bring? How did Abel know this is what would please God? There had to be some revelation that God gave and that Abel obeyed. And Abel took a good offering to the Lord and God respected Abel for understanding and he respected the offering. So in faith is one of those things where when we listen to what, you know, what God is speaking to us and then we just do it, we obey him. What ends up happening is Faith, that because our obedience comes from a place of faith. We have to trust that what we're hearing is from God and that it's his word and that we obey. You know, they didn't have a, a Bible. They didn't have all these books. They had to listen to God and trust that his word was what he was speaking to them was true. And so here it is. Abel obtained a good report with God because he listened to God about what kind of offering to bring. And he brought that to the Lord and it pleased God. In Genesis chapter five, we'll look at Enoch. Okay. So Enoch, uh, it, it says this, Genesis 5, 21 through 24. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah for 300 years and had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and then he was no more because God took him. Now, I want to know... <laughs> the relationship Enoch and God had. I mean, this is some kind of relationship. This is some kind of trust. This is some kind of being pleased with Enoch. Enoch walked in faith. That's what pleased God. That's why he was able to be translated, as it said in Hebrews, he was translated by God into heaven. He didn't see death. He didn't die. God just took him. Because God was like, I enjoy my relationship, my fellowship that I have with Enoch. Okay? And so this is one of these things we have to understand. God enjoys fellowship with us. God is not concerned about your sin. 
2 Corinthians 5, it says it was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. God is not in the business of being concerned about your sins. He's in concerned about you learning who you are, being born from above, being a brand new spirit so that once again, you can look and act like him. You can talk like he talks, a spirit that speaks. You are a spirit that speaks. Oh, man, this is good news. So Enoch here lived a life of pleasing God. How did he please God? By simply believing the word that God spoke to him. Man, thank you, Lord. Thank you that it's not about my, what I do, it's not about how I act and behave, but instead it's about me and the trust that I have in you. That's all God wants from you. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to believe his word. See, that's why there's so many things like with churches nowadays that are trying to redefine things and trying to make all these things where it's just like, no. It's about trusting that this is God's word, that the, 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 the Bible uh, it, it is God's word. It's true and it's from God. And we trust what he says and we just do what he says. No matter what society says, we're just going to trust and believe that this is true. And it's not that I'm against anyone. I'm not against, I'm for everyone. But most importantly, I am for God's design and God's word. I trust that wholly. I give myself to it. Um, so as we go through and we're looking at, a, uh, we're, we're looking at this, the, one of the other people we're going to look at is Abraham. Abram slash Abraham. At this point in time, He's Abram. But the, the thing is, is that Abraham pleased God. Abraham believed God. And, and we're going to read as much. We're going to read in Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 5. It says this. Now, this is the word. This is, I believe, Jesus has, has come to him in a vision. But obviously, he wasn't called Jesus at this time. It says the word came to Abram in a vision. That's how this uh, chapter starts off. And then it says this, he being the word brought him being Abram outside and said, look up toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so will your descendants be Abram be, uh, be. Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. It says it. It gives Abram's testimony. Now, I can show you Abraham was not a perfect acting being. Okay, like I, I, you know, with my wife, I, I have to, I said this to her, but uh, if I were to go, so if we were to go someplace and then I said to this dude, yeah, this is just a friend of mine. See, if I just said to my wife, if I said that my wife is dad, just a friend of mine, just an acquaintance, I was like, you would have none of that. Okay, And so here it is, Abram, he goes up to two kings, not at the same time, but he does this twice. He says of Sarah, this is my sister. Like he does not tell them that this is my wife. He tells them, this is my sister. Like I said, my wife would have none of that. <laughs> okay. What I'm saying is he didn't act perfect all the time, but what he did was he always believed the Lord. In believing the Lord, it was credited to him as righteousness. He had right standing with God because his faith in what God told him pleased 
God. I could show you through even all of the old covenant of the law that it was not about actual fulfilling the law. It was always about faith. David broke the law like it was going out of style. I mean, he did all kind of stuff that was crazy. But the thing was, is this, he had a heart that was yielded and released toward God. He had faith in God. Man, I can go and there's this lion. I'm about to take it by the beard and just bam, pop it upside the head. What, Goliath? I don't care that he's 11 feet tall. Let him come on down here and get some of this. I got God on my side. See, he had a faith that was built on nothing less, nothing less than God's uh, truth. And he received it and he acted in faith. He did, man, I'm telling you what, you think about, think about most ceilings in a houses are about eight feet tall, most ceilings. So think about somebody that's three feet above the ceiling and you're a 17-year-old kid, and not like a big 17-year-old kid, like I was a big 17-year-old kid back in the day, but I'm talking about like a little five-foot-nothing, you know, a hundred-and-something pounds soaking wet little kid. And you look up, and you're looking up at this giant and say, I am about to whoop that. You know what I'm, y'all know where I'm going. That takes somebody who had faith in God and it pleased God. So what I'm getting at to say that faith pleases God is I want you to see in the understanding that we have now, this is the kind of faith that we need to have toward God. This is it. In Mark chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 13. It says this, they brought young children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was very displeased and said to them, allow the little children to come to me and do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter it. The kingdom of God is, is, is it is heavenly, but it's not heaven. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he is talking about God's rule and authority. He's talking about God's way of doing things. Okay? And he's saying that the kingdom of God is is for these little children. God's way of doing things is for these little children. He says to them, as a matter of fact, God's way of doing things, if you don't receive it like a child, you you can't get the kingdom. Okay, if you can't receive the way God does things, you can't receive the kingdom. You can't get into the kingdom. Okay, and so I want you to understand like this. How then does a child receive? (laughs) I've been telling people this lately, and I'm going to tell you. I go, if you were to go and grab a child and tell them, now, you obviously have to have some kind of relationship with the child. So I'm going to say my two daughters. If I were to go up to them, my two daughters, actually, I don't even know if Disneyland would be a big deal for them now because they're so much older. But imagine when they were younger and they were watching The Lion King and all that other kind of stuff, right? And so I say to them, kids, we're going to Disneyland. As soon as... As, while if I had a little speech bubble, while the word Disneyland is still being typed out, they would lose it, right? I mean, if you told any kid, any kid five and under, you just tell them, we're going to go to Great Wolf Lodge. We're going to go to Whitewater. We're going to go to, you know, whatever it is around you. We're going to go to Six Flags. As soon as you said that, before the word was over, before you, 
you, that word hadn't even got done. What is the first thing a kid does after they get this news? Well, first they scream like crazy because they're so excited. They, their exuberance just bubbles over and it's like, Whoa! And they jump and they hop and they do all these things. And then the next thing they do is they run to their room and start packing. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. If you were to tell a kid that kind of news, they just run to their room and start packing. Now, the fact that y'all aren't going for like a month means nothing, right? It's not like you're going right this second. But to that kid, they're already in Disneyland. To that kid, the moment you told them they've already started planning out this is what I'm going to do at Disneyland, and then I'm going to go up and talk to Mickey, and then I'm going to go over here and do this, and then, oh, oh, and then I'm going to go to this, and I'm going to ride this ride, and then we're going to go, and we're going to have cotton candy and have lunch, and then from there I'm going to, I mean, a kid will explain to you in detail all the things they're going to do, and they're doing it with no proof. You, you've not presented to them tickets to Disneyland. You haven't presented to them the, the airfare. You have not presented to them the hotel arrangements. You've given them no proof. The only thing you've given them is your word in saying, we're going to Disneyland. That's the only thing you've given them. And they have from that, from that word, they have gone to their room. Even though it's a month away, they already have packed their bag. They've already put their special stuffed animal into the bag with it. And they're ready to travel. They're ready to go right now. And they've done all of that off of your word. They have no proof that they're going to this place. There is not a shred of proof. They just know daddy said we're going to Disneyland, so we're going to Disneyland. That's how you operate in the kingdom of God. Like a child. So when Jesus says, that you are the righteousness of God in him. He's not asking for you to figure out how that's possible. He's asking for you to jump and rejoice. And he's asking for you to believe that because he said it, it is true. Because he said that, that as I am, so are you in this world. He's not trying to get you to figure, well, how do I rationalize this between this and that? How do I do this? No, he's not asking for that. He's asking you to receive that like a child. And daddy said, I'm like him. <laughs> Glory to God. That's, that's why faith pleases God. Man, it would make you feel great to see your kids go and act totally ridiculous and pack a bag, it, make, it would make you feel good because you know they're going to Disneyland. You have all the proof. You have the tickets and the arrangements and the whole, you, you're the one doing all that. The whole job of the kid is to freaking enjoy Disneyland. That's your job. That's your job in the kingdom of God is to trust God's word. Let him figure out all the logistics and details and you just enjoy the fact that he has made a way for you. He's made a way for you. Faith pleases God. It pleases God because God is a spirit that speaks. It pleases God because when you realize that you're a spirit that speaks and when you put his words in your mouth, the same uh, results that God gets, you will get in this earth. This is a truth 
And I know it seems actually crazy because you just hear, well, just pray to God and maybe he will, maybe he won't. But, you know, it's just, you know, because God, he's all, he just does everything. No, you got to receive the kingdom as it said here. It says this, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom as a little child. So what I'm saying is some of you all need to start praising God because you got a word that, man, I'm forgiven. Well, praise God, glory. I don't have to hold on to the sins of my past. I can let them go because God's let them go. Receive the kingdom of God like a child. Let him worry about the logistics. You worry about receiving and being thankful and grateful to the one who has made a way, who's translated you from the from the kingdom of darkness into the one of his marvelous son. Faith pleases God. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. You are a spirit that speaks. Speak his word. And the same results that God got, you will get also. Have a great day.